Welcome to the Distinguished Speaker event of the um, Department of Natural Resource Ecology and Management Graduate Student Organization, or GSO. My name is Lindsay Buehler, and I'm a master's student in NROM and vice president of the GSO. The GSO serves as the main communicator between graduate students and faculty and works to provide a well-rounded graduate school experience by hosting academic and social events. Creating a new sense of community has been difficult since the start of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. We have worked hard to provide for our fellow graduate students over the last year. Some events that we have hosted this past year have been the weekly coffee hours with graduate students and faculty, a sand volleyball fundraiser, and multiple happy hours. Another event is what we are here for today. Our distinguished speaker is selected by the NRAM graduate student body for his accomplishments in natural resource ecology and management. Our speaker received his bachelor's in biology from Duke University, excuse me, his master's in wildlife conservation from the University of Minnesota, and his PhD in ecology from Syracuse University. Currently, he is a research ecologist with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Agricultural Research Service based in Fort Collins, Colorado, where he has worked for the Range and Resources and System Research Unit since 2006. His research interests include the influence of both domestic and wild mammalian herbivores on the structure, function, and diversity of range and ecosystems. In addition to his focus on livestock and on yields, his research spans taxa, disciplines, and continents, with additional research focused on grassland birds, plant diversity, and stakeholder engagement, as well as ongoing projects across the North American Great Plains and East African savanna. His current research focuses on strategies for adaptively managing livestock to balance trade-offs and achieve synergies in the production of multiple ecosystem services on rangelands. A central component of this work is the application of sensors to monitor and advance our mechanistic understanding of livestock grazing behavior and distribution. Additionally, he is co-PI for the long-term agroecosystem research site located at the Great Plains Experimental Range in Colorado and is considered one of the top rangeland scientists in the world. Why are you laughing? <laughs> It is my pleasure to introduce our 2023 NRM Distinguished Speaker, Dr. David Augustine. Yeah, I was just laughing because I was wondering if ChatGPT wrote that for you or <laughs> no, I it sounded too, too accurate though. <laughs> okay, um, thanks for the invitation from the Graduate Student Organization. Thanks Sam for a great tour of the tall grass prairie yesterday. My first time to get out there and see it. It was really nice to be out there on a day where they were burning. Um, okay, so what I'm going to try to talk to you about today is get you to think about how can metrics of foraging behavior potentially guide the management of, of rangelands and it guide adaptive management of rangelands for multiple ecosystem services. Um, what I'm going to do with this talk, I mean, it'll be divided basically the roadmap is two sections. I'm going to spend some time telling you about an experiment that we've been running in Colorado for the past 10 years now. So we're just starting our 10th year, actually our 11th year with pre treatment. And um, so I'll, I'll spend some time just like laying out the, the design of that experiment and one of the main findings from it. And then I'll get into the foraging behavior part and just talk to you about how we've been measuring foraging behavior within the context of that experiment as well as others. And what we're beginning to learn about how to use um, the data that we get from on, on animal sensors out of these studies. So that's the outline. And then how do I advance this? Just do page down. All right, at least we can read the top. Okay, so I'm going to talk a lot about this, this term harm, collaborative adaptive range and management. So I'll just briefly introduce it. Um, just in terms of what, what do we mean by collaborative and adaptive? Um, hmm. Let's see here. There it is. Okay, um, so first of all, in terms of it being adaptive and managing rangelands adaptively, one of our central challenges is matching the available forage in any given place and time with the animal demand. So um, this is a huge challenge for uh, our experimental range working with ranchers in Eastern Colorado. This graph is showing you the variability in mean annual rainfall or in annual rainfall over 80 years for our experimental range in Colorado. You can see the highest and the lowest rainfall both occurred uh, in the middle of the 1960s. We've got super wet decades, super wet, super dry decades. Uh, so in any given year, it's really unpredictable um, what's going to happen in terms of forage production. We're going right now, we're April, um, and we're, there's a meeting right now happening with uh, the ranchers that graze on Pawnee National Grassland. 
that I, I missed it. The first time I've missed this in the past few days. Um, discussing what should their stocking rates be on Hani this year because everybody's so uncertain about what the fish forage production is going to look like this year. And we have almost no soil moisture. Similar for you guys right now. Um, you don't have much soil moisture in the ground, and people are probably worrying about what's what storage size. So, how do we adjust animal abundance and space and time and manage um, for, uh, animal demand for forage adaptively? And then, in terms of the collaborative part, um, we recognize we really do need to be more collaborative in this day and age in terms of how we manage rangelands because society wants a lot more things out of rangelands than just beef. Uh, I'm mostly going to talk about uh, cattle and beef production today. Uh, but we recognize that we want wildlife habitat, we want soil carbon sequestration, all kinds of things. So um, different stakeholders want different things from rainfall. And so when we, we're making decisions on how to manage them and what we're managing them for, we need collaborative processes. So um, about uh, just, just over 10 years ago in 2012, a group of scientists, including myself and others from my research unit, in ARS uh, from the top of this list, we uh, started to think about the future next 10 years of our research. And what should we really be focusing on? And specifically, we're thinking about how can we do research in a way that's more collaborative and uh, addresses adaptive management of, of ranges. We don't often do that. So the first thing we did is we uh, started to pull together a team of more diverse scientists well, we started talking to some social scientists uh, about how can we incorporate them into our research. Uh, uh, we brought in an eco economist, uh, eco hydrologist, uh, and people with more expertise than just rangeland ecologists, and built a research team and started thinking about how we could all um, develop uh, an experiment together. The second thing that was happening at that time is in 2011, I don't know if many of you remember, but this, this publication came out conservation benefits of rangeland practices. And it was really an evaluation by a commission by NRCS of uh, are, we, are our rangeland management practices really giving us the conservation benefits that we think they're giving us? A lot of discussion about rotational grazing practices and other prescribed grazing practices that came out of um, papers um, from people like Dave Risky, Sam Kuhlendorf and others questioning whether we really have strong scientific underpinning to understand how uh, we get conservation benefits from our rangeland practices. Uh, they uh, recommended these three things from that review, use adaptive management to optimize conservation benefits. It's something that's very hard to do in an experimental context. Uh, the integrate ecological scales and human dimensions and expand conservation science partnerships. So we wanted to try to address what was coming out of this, this publication. The second thing we were thinking about is the lack of science conducted at management relevant scales. This was really highlighted in some of the reviews of rotational grazing. Um, traditionally, we, as scientists, I like to like break things down into nice neat square uh, plots where we uh, eliminate heterogeneity from our experimental design. And of course, that's not the world that rangeland management occurs in. It's not the world that ranchers operate in. And then the third thing that I was interested in um, uh, I, I collaborate with a lot of the national grasslands in my research, and um, because they're public land, they were very concerned about declining grassland bird populations uh, in the western Great Plains. Uh, grassland birds have been identified as one of the most rapidly declining uh, guild of birds in North America, and uh, that's been blamed both on conversion of rangelands to croplands, of course, that's been a huge issue. There are also a lot of place questions about how can our grazing management do a better job of uh, of providing uh, grassland bird habitat. And of course, a lot of that, uh, the ideas for that research were coming out of OSU, coming out of research done at the tall grass prairie in terms of how we can potentially measure, manage for more heterogeneity in the grasslands instead of less. So um, we were thinking about how can we build all these into an experiment uh, and do, conducting this experiment at the Central Plains Experimental Range where I work. This is a, about a 6,000 hectare government owned ranch, so 16,000 acres. And it's on the western wet side of the or dry side of the Great Plains, uh, pretty much an opposing endpoint from the tall grass prairie, uh, with about 340 millimeters of mean annual rainfall. Uh, so this green here is the outline of our experimental range in eastern Colorado. 
and it shows you uh, the layout of an experiment that we put together. This was uh, designed in 2012, and basically we set up 20 pastures. Each of these pastures is 320 acres. Uh, and the reason we picked that scale, that was about as big as we could go while still having a lot of replication. And at the 320 acre scale, um, there is a lot of heterogeneity in soil types and plant communities within each of these pastures. Uh, they're paired based on soils and, and, and topography. So this is a pair, uh, this is a pair. So we've got 10 pairs, 20 pastures in total. And the other thing that, that I would like to start out telling you about the the study or the study area is that the eastern part, you can see there's this creek running through the middle. So the eastern part is mostly sandy soils, sandy plains ecological site that's uh, dominated mainly by C3 grasses with a C4 understory. And then west of the creek is uh, mostly loamy plains ecological site, and those are mostly C4 dominated uh, grasslands. And so we also have heterogeneity among pastures to work with. And we thought, okay, what we were thinking about is these could be thought of as each representing a, 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 an individual ranch. Uh, we said, we're going to take the, the, the yellow ranch and apply a traditional range of management treatment where we're just going to run stalkers season long from May to October in each pasture. So each of those yellow pastures gets its own herd, so low stock density uh, for about five months each year. Um, and when I, I call this, this is pretty much what happens on most of the allotments. Uh, on Pawnee National Grasslands. Some of them are rotational, but the majority are not. Um, and then this is also the way we've been running the station since uh, it was opened in 1939. Okay, and then the other thing we did in 2012 is we formed a group of stakeholders to add, get their input in how to uh, design an adaptive grazing management experiment. We told them we want, we're looking for stakeholders who are interested in grazing management practices, we uh, selected four ranchers from Crow Valley Livestock Cooperative. So that's a cooperative of about 50 folks that have grazing permits on Pawnee National Grassland. Um, and then we selected representatives from each of three conservation NGOs who are really interested in grassland bird conservation. And uh, so that's the Nature Conservancy, Environmental Defense Fund, and Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. And then we asked uh, each of four uh, land management agencies to nominate one representative to serve on this stakeholder group. And so we took these 11 people and we said, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna give you a piece of land. Uh, we're gonna give you the blue pastures and you can manage it however you want for whatever outcomes you want, as long as all 11 of you agree. So that's the hitch, right? <laughs> and um, so this is the collab, this is our what we call our CARM treatment. It was designed by the, the management was designed by the stakeholders. We did give them sideboards. We said, you know, we'd really appreciate if you could use steers because it's hard for us to get cows. And uh, you got to graze from May to October. So that they had those sideboards, but you can do whatever you want besides that. So first thing we did was we had those 11 stakeholders sit down for a three day workshop in 2012. And we asked them, what do you want out of this piece of land? What do you, what do you want to manage it for? And I was pretty nervous about how this is going to go. Um, my boss, Justin Turner, I would like to credit him as the leader of this. He was very excited. I was very nervous. Um, and it went really well. Nobody really argued. It was so, it was amazing how easy it was. Everybody was just like, yeah, we want to manage the land and pass it on to future, future generations for both ecological and economic uh, sustainability. Uh, we divided our goals up into four groups for vegetation, profitable ranching operations, wildlife, and collaborative learning. And even within those, we didn't have much trouble um, coming to agreement on what we wanted. They had some specific goals for increasing C3 grass production, uh, in ranching, a big goal was reducing the impact of drought. And then for wildlife, it was all birds. Um, we developed specific objectives for uh, six bird species. Uh, the only thing that was really, we really couldn't come to an agreement on was prairie dogs. Um, and so we finally agreed to keep prairie dogs out of this experiment. Um, and study them separately. So, sorry. Uh, yeah, that, that was um, just too much of an issue to, to bring into this experiment. Okay, so then we asked them to develop an adaptive management plan. We gave them a year. Um, so during 2013, we said, we'll go and take pre-treatment measurements on all the, all the pastures. We ran them all the season long, grazing all 20, and we measured things that they wanted us to measure. 
And they decided to, that what they wanted to do as a group was manage all the cattle as one large herd rotated among pastures. And they were especially for this drought goal. They wanted to um, try to rest two pastures each year. We move into a drought, they could then use the all 10 pastures. If we have really wet years, they agree we will even try to graze fewer pastures and just base rotations on these criteria here based on how much precipitation we have, forage biomass, species composition, and then the seasonality of growth in the C3 versus C4 pastures. And so, yeah, the, the general rotation would always start on the same plains because it greens up sooner, move into the, the warm season pastures in the middle of the summer, and then rotate back. That was a big part of the strategy thinking if we have these movements between these different plant communities, we can improve our livestock production. Rested pastures can make us more drought resistant, and the rested pastures can provide habitat for certain birds that we were interested in managing for. So this is just a brief overview of the uh, of the experimental design. You know, 10 pastures rotationally grazed or two rested. If they decide they could adjust the stocking rate, they decided each year the stakeholders. Whatever they decide for the stocking rate, we divide it by 10 and put those in the season long pastures. So the main thing we try to do, we also offer options for doing patch burning within it. Whatever, whatever they decided to do, we tried to match it in the traditionals, with the exception that the carm treatment always differs in the spatiotemporal movement of the cattle during the growing season. So it's really a question about what can you achieve with your movement of cattle in space and time and also adjusting it up and down each year. So baseline measurements in 2013, and we, you know, we did monitoring of vegetation, measurements on the cattle, and then monitoring the bird populations and their habitat. And then we started treatments in 2014. We've been running it for nine years now. 2022 is our ninth year, and we're about to start our 10th and last year of the experiment. So it's been most of my career. I've lost a lot of hair during this experiment. <laughs> Okay, I'm not gonna talk about birds very much. I'd be happy to later or after this if folks want to in terms of the bird outcomes. I'm not gonna talk too much about the vegetation outcomes. I'm just gonna focus on cattle for, for the rest of this talk. So in terms of cattle weight gains for the first six years, um, I'm sure some of you in the audience could have predicted this before we started this experiment, but um, we still need to do it. And Pre-treatment, identical cattle weight gains over the course of the growing season of 2013. And then for the first six years, every year, the carn herd, the rotational herd is getting about 10 to 15% lower weight gain than the season long traditional herds. Even with all that we were trying to do in terms of adaptive behavior from C3 to C4 in the summer, really thinking carefully about the timing and rate of rotations, Every single year, and then over the course of these six years, there's some years we rotated fast, some years we rotated slower, based on which stakeholder was more upset about why we were or more confused about why we were getting lower weight gains. But in the end, for the first six years, no matter what we did, managing it as one larger, we always got 10 to 15 percent lower weight gain in the rotationally managed herd. So the question is why, right? Um, and certainly there was a lot of diversity of opinions among both the scientists and the stakeholders as to why this was occurring. A lot of active discussion over the years. So um, what I wanna do is, with the re remainder of this is really talk about um, metrics of foraging behavior. What did we measure in this experiment and what can we potentially learn from those metrics of foraging behavior? And I ask this question, what can metrics of foraging behavior potentially tell us about the timing of rotations the length of graze periods, you know, when should we be rotating? Can it give us indications of how to better time our rotations? Uh, and what is the effect of herd size on the quality and quantity of forage being consumed? Okay, so um, during the first five years, what I did, um, one of my parts of the experiment was to uh, track animals with GPS collars. Uh, I use traditional GPS collars uh, with GPS fixes that are recorded at five minute intervals. So these are just traditional low tech 3300 LRs. I bet there's some people in here who have used them. Um, they do have a dual, dual axis activity sensor recording at five minute intervals. So in between each fix, we you know we can assess whether the animal was mostly grazing or mostly not grazing in that five minute period. Uh, in this case, they're still on board. So no real time transmission to the manager or to the owner or manager of the cattle. Um, but I'll talk a little bit later about some other models that do have that ability to communicate with the manager. 
And then um, in terms of sample sizes, we put out 20 callers on the uh, traditional cattle. That's two per herd across those 10, herd, 10 herds, and then 10 callers on the farm herd. And we ran these continuously from May to October for uh, five years. Okay, so what do, what do we calculate? Like, how do we use these data, right? These, uh, I've done a bunch of analyses of kind of the grazing distribution and resource selection functions in these pastures, but there's a lot more information that we can get out of kind of GPS collar data. And so the first two, uh, I'll talk about four metrics that I calculated from this. The first is the time spent grazing, which is just the sum of all five minute intervals in which more than 50% of the interval is spent grazing. Second one's grazing bout duration. This is the mean length of intervals where the animals graze continuously at a five minute resolution. <coughs> so, uh, like if the animal grazes continuously for six five minute intervals, and then the next five minute interval it's not grazing, and then it starts again, that's the end of the bout. It's a 30 minute bout. So, you calculate the length of all the bouts in a given day and do this at a daily level. So, each day, what's the mean length of grazing bouts? And that's really an index of how often is the animal stopping. For a little a while, stopping its grazing behavior and, and uh, maybe looking around, but not just stopping briefly, stopping for a full five minutes and then starting a new bout. And then the third thing we looked at is mean turning angle uh, while grazing. So this is a measure of the tortuosity of the grazing pathways. And so anytime we get three point three fixes in a row where the animal is deemed to be grazing for the whole 10 minute interval, we calculate the turn angle for that time period, and it's uh, the turn angle is measured in deviation from a straight line in degrees. And we do this you know, at, at a daily, though. what's the mean daily turn angle while grazing? And then finally, what is the mean velocity while grazing? And we set them, measure that uh, five minute resolution and uh, calculate each day. What's the, how fast are they moving when they are grazing? Okay, so I'll show you a bunch of graphs that look like this. Um, so I'll explain it briefly. Um, so this is the, on the x-axis, we have day of grazing season. And like I said, we, we graze about mid-May to October 1st. So it's a 140-day grazing season. So zero is May 5th, approximately May 15th. And then the y-axis here, I've got one of these four metrics, turn angle while grazing. And then this is the, the black dots, is the mean turn angle for those 10 callers, or at least the ones that were working during uh, that interval. Or during that particular day. So I've screened this out where we only use data where the caller works for at least 95% of all the five minute intervals that day. Um, I would say the low techs were surprisingly um, effective. I have very little uh, dysfunction until like the fifth year of the study. Most of these years, um, we are getting uh, like nine or 10 data points out of the 10 callers or like 18 to 20 data points out of the 20 callers. So it worked pretty well. I was surprised how effective it was. Um, and then so the, the dot is the average of the 10 farm callers and the white dot's the average of the 10 uh, or the 20 TRM callers. So recall that the, the TRM, they're in, they're, these are 20 animals from each of 10 pastures, but they're in the same pastures the whole grazing season, right? So that's why I had the dash line continuous fit through them. And then the solid red lines are the rotation. That's the farm herd gets rotated uh, through the different pastures. So this is the first year, it was a high rainfall year. Uh, in this particular case, based on the criteria that the stakeholders set, we rotated through uh, seven different pastures over the course of the grazing season and we rested three. And so uh, the most important thing I wanna emphasize here is the difference that we're seeing in mean turn angle while grazing between the farm and the PRM um, during the first half of the growing season. And that corresponds to the period of most active vegetation growth. So, so this beginning here, this is green up and then this is kind of slow brown down the second half of the growing season um, is when the cattle are not gaining near as fast. So typically we're gaining around three to four pounds per head per day at the beginning and maybe and typically less than two pounds per head per day in the second. So really, this, this difference here in the beginning of the season is really important in terms of what are the animals doing in terms of foraging behavior. Uh, and so what we see is a, a much uh, lower weight gain in the carn herd is consistently associated with more linear foraging pathways. So this turn angle is much closer to a straight line, but raised in straight line, more straight lines across the pasture in each of their grazing bouts. 
And then the second thing is we do this across a lot of different um, a lot of different growing season conditions, right? So I mean, we have huge variation from year to year. So look how the uh, if we go to the wet year, you can see how the turn angle of the TRM cattle goes way up. In a dry year, the turn turn angle of the TRM cattle goes down. Uh, but we still, it's not as big of a difference, but in the drier years, you still have a very significant difference in mean turn angle while grazing. Uh, and this persists even more past the, the halfway point of the grazing season until it converges later. Uh, and so all five years, we see this happening with the mean turn angle while grazing. The second one that was really significant in terms of those four metrics that I told you about, uh, is that lower weight gain in corn was consistently associated with more linear foraging pathways and with low velocity while grazing. Again, this is most prominent in the in the beginning, the first two thirds of the grazing season, when they converge at the end. You can see that uh, the TR and cattle are grazing at much higher velocity, they're moving at a much higher velocity when they're grazing, around nine to ten meters per minute early on. Uh, the corn cattle start out at six to seven meters per minute and persist like that all the way across as vegetation semesters over the course of the growing season does start grazing slower and slower and slower until they converge. Um, the other interesting thing I think about this graph as you can see um, there is one exception to that pattern which is when you rotate the cattle. So when you rotate a big bunch of steers into a new pasture they walk around quickly so they graze much faster for the first couple of days. That's because they're just grazing a loop around the entire pasture trying to make sure they know where the boundaries are and what's in there. And once they get that loop done once or twice, then they just kind of settle down and start grazing in more linear pathways at a slow rate. And every time you rotate them, they go do their looping thing and move at a high rate, um, but then they settle back down at this much lower rate of grazing, typically on about the third day after the rotation. Okay, and then the other thing we did is we had a group of technicians that got to go out and collect poop every Friday, the poop group. And so um, we took, we collected uh, fecal samples from the carn herd and from TRM herds once a week. And we just pulled those all and sent them to the GAM lab at the Grazing Animal Nutrition Lab in Texas AM. And uh, yeah, it's a little expensive to be doing this frequently. So that's why we only have one data point per week. Uh, but you, again, you can see there's a really significant difference in crude protein in the diet of these animals. And it really parallels the changes that we see in the foraging behavior metrics. So what we found is that the faster they're grazing and the more tortuous, the more they're weaving through the vegetation as they're grazing, the higher the crude protein in the diet and when they graze more linearly, and slow down their grazing below about seven meters per minute, uh, protein in the diet drops significantly. So it seems that this provides a pretty mechanistic basis for understanding why these animals are getting lower weight gains consistently every year, except the, the large herd, these animals are somewhat constrained by their neighbors. And when they're, even though it's, I mean, when you look at these herds, they're not, it's not like the animals look crowded into a small space. This isn't high intensity, short duration grazing where you're stuffing them into whatever it is, a million pounds per acre, whatever they talk about. Um, this is, I mean, the animals do not look crowded, but they're foraging differently because they have more of a, and they're in a larger herd. They're in a herd of typically 50 to 60 animals foraging together. So I'll show you what the foraging pathways look like. Uh, the upper one, this upper pasture is one of our farm herds that the, where it's a large herd rotated through. Uh, and this herd, in this particular year, it rotated through eight pastures. I think it was in this pasture for about 18 days uh, versus a small herd grazing season long in a single paddock. And so the upper one will show you eight steers for one day in a herd of 244 versus uh, one steer for eight days in a herd of 24. And so, uh, so this is, these are different days. These are different steers. With the same number of grazing days. And what you can see is there's this water here, water point up here. And this herd just grazes out in straight lines. When they leave the water, they graze back in straight lines to the water. Whereas the smaller herd, the individuals are just moving much more through the vegetation. You get a very different pattern of grazing 
And this seems to be what coil and what truly driving that difference in food protein of the diet, as well as with the difference in digestibility of the diet. Okay. So then this, when I show this, people always say, okay, well, did the, did the rotational grazing then spread out the grazing more evenly and have a benefit to the, to the vegetation? How does that affect the vegetation? So I'm going to walk you through a few heat maps of grazing distribution based on these findings of the difference in foraging behavior. So the upper left is a corn pasture, and the lower right is a traditional grazed six season long pasture. And what we have here is two steers in the upper left, two steers in the lower right, each uh, for 12 days. So it's the exact same number of grazing days. And this is during the period of time when the corn herd was in here. So this is kind of like a prepared, at that time of year, what's the grazing distribution of the same numbers? Remember, there's there's 200 some steers in here and 20 some in here. But this is just two steers versus two steers. And I think you can see this is about grazing seconds per pixel. So we actually calculate each step of the animal based on the pixels and assign number of grazing seconds to each pixel. And so you can see it is way more clustered, right? So this farmer is. These two steers are grazing in a much more even pat pattern across the paddock compared to these TRM. See, there's some really um, clustered patches. And again, what we do here is we pull out only those five minute intervals where they're grazing. So this is not bedding time or standard time, this is just grazing time. So we get much more clustered um, grazing distribution in TRM. We also have big patches in TRM that are ungrazed. But you might say this is. Well, this is an unfair comparison because this one got grazed the whole year. So, and this one only got grazed for a couple of weeks. So how do we, and this is two versus two. So the other way I've looked at it is to say, okay, what if we uh, look at the grazing distribution over the whole year? So the upper left is 10 steers for 12 days. And the lower right is one steer for 120 days. So they're both heat maps are 120 grazing days, but a large number for a short time versus a small number for a long time. And again, you can see it's even more clustered. It's hugely clustered. They're really heavily, you know, the, the grazing time is heavily clustered down here on the right, uh, as well as that patch in the middle. And there are certain patches that are missing. And then um, the carver is grazing very evenly across the whole pasture. Uh, but the, the catch here is that this is a wet year. This was way above average precipitation and way above average forage production. So although we had um, concentrated grazing down here, the vegetation was so productive during that year that um, the grazing didn't look, you weren't seeing signs of intense grazing in the vegetation because uh, the percentage of the primary productivity that was grazed in this year was quite low because we didn't anticipate the forage production being that high. And so you, you get very concentrated grazing in certain patches, uh, but we're not seeing like, Bare soil formation. Doesn't look over. Okay, so what happens in a dry year? So this is again is the same thing. On the left, we have a corn herd in a dry year. Um, this is 10 steers for 12 days, and this is one steer for 120 days. What you can see is if as forage availability in a particular year gets lower, you get much more even grazing in the traditional season long. They're basically spreading out and using the entire pasture. We don't have any real strong clustering. Um, if you run spatial statistics on that, there are a couple of things I could tell you that are slightly different between these two panels. Um, but overall, they're pretty similar in their grade. You can see on the right that it's, it is a little more um, clumps because they're, they're weaving through these patches. Uh, it's a little more spider web in here because they're moving straight. There still is difference in foraging behavior, but not a difference in grazing distribution. Um, how far do I need to go here? How am I doing on time? The three, okay, I think I know where I am. Okay, so um, yeah, the conclusion here is that by grouping them up into a large herd, running to run rotational grazing, you always have to increase your stock density. This, what we find is this leads to less selective foraging behavior, reduced turn angles, reduced velocity while grazing were the best indicators. Grazing time per day told us nothing. Uh, grazing alteration was interesting, but not as strong as these other two factors. Uh, this leads to consumption of diets with reduced digestibility and free protein. 
and ultimately a reduction in livestock weight gain uh, on the order of 10 to 15 percent. And at least for the first five years of this experiment, we see no difference in or no effect of these two different grazing regimes on vegetation. No effect on vegetation productivity and no effect on species composition. And that we think is because when we get those dry years, uh, the grazing distribution is fairly even. Um, with the rotation, some pastures are getting grazed heavier in certain years, but then they're getting rested in other years, and the net over five years is no difference. Okay, so if daily foraging metrics can predict weight gain, well, our stakeholders want to know well, can foraging behavior provide a real time indicator? Of cattle weight gain and how, I, how I, might we approach that? So um, the next thing I'll tell you about is, so we designed a study in response to this question, um, trying to quantify how foraging behavior can provide real-time indicators of cattle performance. I use this collar called a Mooniture. So this is a company out of Israel, developed these are government scientists from uh, Israel, the, the range scientists designed this product. Um, it records GPS locations every five minutes, but it has a three axis accelerometer that um, every four seconds, it takes the numbers from the accelerometer and predicts whether we're resting or we're grazing. And it's with a proprietary algorithm. So I don't know how it works, but we did direct observations on the cattle and it was predictive and it worked quite well. Um, so you can aggregate that, you can look at every four seconds as it grazing, you can aggregate that up every five minutes like we did with the, the low tech and it's it grazing or not. Uh, this is an example on a cow. This is on a yearly steer. So we've done it on both. Um, this up here, they have a cheek, uh, so they have a solar panel on each side. So you can leave these collars on year round. Um, typically in January, the daylight is so short. But um, you know, it's, you don't have to adjust or change batteries too often. And the the the, the way they're trying to sell this collar is it has a, it connects to the sa a satellite. It has a, uh, communicates with the satellite once a day, typically right around midnight, and it'll take a small packet of data off the collar, and it can analyze on board the the accelerometer data, and then it'll send that to the rancher. And so every morning when you get your coffee, you turn on your computer, and you can find it. it'll give you three locations: where was your animal yesterday morning, afternoon, and evening, and then. It'll give you some metrics derived from the accelerometer. Now, I'm not here to sell miniature collars. Um, unfortunately, I don't think they, they're, they're not in the price range that would be practical for any rancher, and they're not in a durability range that would be practical for any rancher. Had a lot of problems with them breaking, but I did get enough work to, to show you some results from them that I think are very interesting. So, um, what we did for this study is we picked four paddocks that we knew differed really dramatically in their history of grazing, but we all had all had the same soil type. Um, two of them were selected because they had high forage availability, hadn't been grazed too heavily for a long time. One was selected because it has a long history of very heavy grazing. It's just a pure um, carpet of, of blue grandma, so lower productivity. And then this one, and a mixed plant community that had very, a lot of prairie dogs in it, so they were just keeping it down. So we just wanted two pastures where available forage is really low, and two pastures where available forage is really high, so we could we stock them all similar and ask what do the foraging behavior metrics look like. The other thing, this graph, the way I made this graph is um, over the past couple of years, uh, one of the things I'm really excited about is we've developed an algorithm for predicting um, standing forage biomass at a daily level from the satellites. We use the Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8 together. So we get 30 meter pixel resolution daily estimates of forage biomass for every pixel in our experimental range. And then I can, so these curves are the daily estimates uh, from our study pastures uh, for 2019. And then, um, so let me explain this. So what we did is as we were going through the, the 2019 growing season, it got really dry in the middle of the summer and forage biomass started declining and it declined really precipitously in these two pastures to where we're already starting to get nervous. They get nervous. The range man gets nervous. So he said, oh, perfect time to put out miniatures and see if they test the difference. So we weighed the cattle here and here on the solid box. And we put miniature collars on cattle in each of the four pastures during this period. And then we decided to continue with the next year. We were hoping to get um, hoping to get a nice wet spring. We did not. We got a drought. 
Um, so the biomass didn't go up. This is a period of green vegetation, but fairly low, still a difference. And then here in this lake in the drought, this is when um, we're all the way down to 300 pounds per acre in these pastures. So these cattle are barely making it. Um, just to show you, this is just showing there's green vegetation at the beginning, uh, high total digestible nutrients and high crude protein, and then mostly dead vegetation uh, at the end of the study in the third period. And again, we weigh the cattle at the beginning and then here and put the, the collars on here and then calculate those daily metrics for the whole period that the collars are on. So the question is what metrics best predict animal weight gain? And, and again, I did all four that I talked about earlier. And uh, what we found here uh, is that the two on the x-axis, grazing about duration calculated at a five minute interval and mean velocity while grazing uh, were the best predictors. In this case, in terms of assessing these differences in forage availability and quality across pastures, tortuosity wasn't an uh, important predictor, but uh, grazing about duration was. And grazing about duration goes above about 140 minutes per bout. That's when the animals just have their head down, they're grazing continuously for a very long time because of the kind of forage that they make and their weight gains decline significantly. And then we also seen the same correlation with velocity while grazing. So grazing bout duration and velocity while, gra while grazing, they're actually able to predict 62% of the variation in uh, daily weight gain of these yearling steers. Okay, so takeaways from this are that indicators of how stock density affects uh, cattle performance. Um, as we are changing that the herd size, it seems that uh, that grazing pathway tortuosity is a pretty sensitive indicator of, of how selective the animal is able to graze, as well as velocity while grazing. They, they operate together. And then when we have changes in forage availability, if you put cattle out in the pasture, and you're wondering, are they starting to run out of forage? Is their performance starting to decline? Well, uh, velocity while grazing and grazing bout duration seem to be good indicators of this. Um, let me see if I can, I think I have him grazing. Yeah, so this is just to show you uh, what uh, the behavior of an animal while uh, they're grazing very low biomass in this forage and probably not gaining weight, maybe even losing weight. So just a constant grazing for a very long time with their head down, um, moving, uh, just taking what's in front of them. So um, the main thing is just that I'll end here with just saying the metrics of foraging behavior have the potential to form decisions for all these, the timing of rotations, length of graze periods, when to transition cattle from range to feedlot. We're really focused on that third one right now. We're finding that our ranchers have almost always sold their yearlings on Octo around October 1st. And what that analysis I did with the monitors showed us it would have been way more profitable to sell them a, a September 1st or in that drought year to sell them October or August 15th. So just knowing when they're starting to go on that poor plane of nutrition can help us know when to sell them. Um, and also when to begin destocking in droughts. Um, so I don't, I mean, I, I don't think we have it operational yet. I know I would not recommend the miniature collar to anyone to actually use in a practical way. Um, I know that you guys have a Vents project coming up here with some of the folks in this room. And, uh, you know, I think the virtual fence platform is creating a platform where we can talk to these animals every day. We can talk to their callers every day. But right now, nobody's making, uh, nobody's using these kind of behavioral foraging metrics to uh, get some information. So I think we're missing out on what kind of information we can be getting from these animals. And again, uh, matching it with remote sensing, like we're trying to, we can, re we can do remote sensing with the vegetation. That tells us one thing, but the animal's behavior is telling us just as much about the vegetation. I think we could do more to be using that. So um, these are a few of uh, the publications we have out and there's one more that's coming soon, hopefully, um, about the, uh, it's like the turn angle measurements. Um, and so my email's here, if you have additional questions or want more information, be in touch and I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, very good. It's just too much to talk about. But um, 
We gave him the option to be perhaps learning uh, one of the bird species that's an objective in our study, really only S on ferns. So are you doing that? So they've done ferns in I think about five of the five or nine years. Um, that has always been controversial. None of the ranchers want to burn, and all the conservation people want to burn. And so it's just, and we have, we ended up, after the first year of the study, we ended up with a super majority for us. So we have to have more, there could be like one dissenter, but um, we have to get the majority agreement. Uh, so we have done back patch burns. We have, uh, so what we've typically done it as one or two patch burns, and we usually start the cattle in those. So we're never burning the whole pasture. And um, we have gotten mountain plovers nesting on the patch ferns in our study, so that's been good. But when we go into dry years, no, but there's no burn. It's just if you have, if we come out of a year with a huge amount of excess residual, then people are like, all right, the ranchers are like, that's not good. Uh, what I've learned from it, unfortunately, is I don't think any of those ranchers would ever do incorporate burning into their management on their own. Um, but we have, and the way we paired it, so if they choose to burn, we burn. Same number of acres in the parent pasture. So that hasn't been a treatment. And we do see uh, the patch burning works better for, for it works better in um, the small herds. You really see selective use. But the big herd, what we were getting was they would graze down the burn so fast that then it'd be like a week of grazing the burn, then go back, graze off the burn, and then let it regrow and then go back on. And I was asking someone <laughs> about the ranch that you're talking about. Which you might see at, at the burn scale, you know, with torch lots of people trying to do I didn't look at, at the burn scale, but it didn't change. The, the magnitude of the difference between current and TRM didn't, had nothing to do with burn. I think it's a herd size thing. Yeah. Did the, did the committee ever learn to stop trying to do rotational grazing, or they just kept? Kept doing it, trying to do it different ways. Oh, uh, they did. They learned. Uh, that's why I only have the first six years here. So, okay, so they stopped. Seven, eight, and nine. Um, they well, no, they didn't stop. They cut the herd in half. So, so for the past three years, we managed them as two herds, two rotational herds, to see if bringing the stock density down by half would increase the or reduce the difference, right, between carbon and TRM. Of course, as soon as we decided to do that, we got a severe drought. <laughs> and um, so of the three years we, we, that we've been running a split herd, two of them have been severe droughts. And in those years, Clem and TRM both just gained miserably and the same, they're just both equally bad. And then the one year that we had some grass, um, Clem still lost to him, even after we reduced the herd size. So we're going to run it one more year of the split herd. Hope we don't have a drought. So I can't. I already got my two droughts out of the way. You know, you always want one drought in your studies, but not, not too many. And then we're going to, but the at the light, latest meeting last fall, the, the ranchers who provide the cattle were pretty much like, we're done with this. We want to do something different. And so we're we're going to do a more like a two pasture rotation um, as we move into the, because they want some control over what's going on, but then we're going to do much larger pasture sizes, like combined pastures and much larger blocks. So that the stock density will go down. Yeah. Um, you kind of did a great job of showing like the main differences. I'm curious about the variation between, especially between pastures and rotational grazing. Were, were there like pastures that actually did worse than the CRM? And like, um, and like between individual cows, there was consistent variation between those. I mean, so the lonely pastures always produce well. So with, with the TRMs, you've got half of them on lands, half of them on sandy soils. So the sandy soils always produce way more than the, the lonely pastures. So you have that variation, whereas the carnivores are moving across it. Um, I would say that there was a lot of variation among grazed versus rested pastures. So, of course, rested pastures got much taller. Um, the pulse grade, the pastures that were grazed by the rotational herd got a little bit shorter. And we did have one bird species, grasshopper sparrow, that responded very positively to the rotational grazing. So we have very significant increases in corn for grasshopper sparrows relative to TRM. Um, on the short side, we also had two, two bird species, hornlark and pitcoat longsbird, that we wanted to 
enhanced habitat before on the short side. Horned lark went up, which is kind of nice, but they're everywhere. The thick tailed longsbird, uh, which is a, a species of significant conservation concern, did not respond to either. It's, it's been declining all 10 years of both treatments at the same rate. So we're still concerned about that. David, I'm curious if, if you didn't tell me anything else except that one bird was traveling faster and turning more, I would have thought their weight gain could be less because they've been extending their energy. But ah. It's just the opposite. So, why? So, they probably were extending more energy, but there's other factors that are allowing them to gain more. Is that correct? Yes. And I actually don't think there's much energetics going on here. Okay. Um, what we're talking about is moving six to seven meters per minute versus moving nine to ten meters per minute. It's not like these animals are running. They're still they're all walking fairly slowly. And I don't think there's a, like a notable. And I'm sure there's a very small increase in energetic expenditure, but it's really just. I mean, it's describing these animals are just, the current animals are are grazing in a straight line and just eating what's in front of their face, and not not looking around and. They, you know, they're not being selective. The TRM animals are just taking a few extra steps every five minutes to go over and grab that form or get it or, or, or to skip a bite that has too much dead in it and move on to the next patch that has a little more green. So I think that's all it is. Uh, we did do pedometers. Um, we did pedometers on them as well. And um, this, if you average it over the whole year, the step rates are almost the same. The, step, the total number of steps that the TRM are taking is a little bit less than they're grazing, but then they have, on the days they rotate, they take more. And so it ends up about the same total steps on the thermometer. It's just a very big difference in portion. Yeah. So I Yeah, so that's uh, pretty much nothing happened in the first five years of vegetation. I think we're going to see some things in the second five years and maybe some interactions with drought. So I'll get back to you on that. And then the birds really was just carn was better for carn was significantly better for grasshopper sparrows, all the other species, no effect. And we, we are currently trying to design some new grazing uh, ideas, some new grazing <coughs> approaches to manage for that short side. Um, you, you mentioned that in certain drought years, it might be more, it's probably more profitable for ranchers to sell their cattle August 15th or September 1st. Um, what is the, what is the difference in the profit margins between selling at the optimal date and selling at the conditional date? Yeah, I need a, uh, so John Ritten needs all my economic analysis. It's not huge, but I would need to look it up. Think about it. I mean, it's just, I just know with the price slide, when you sell, we almost always have a price slide. So the earlier you sell, the more you get per pound. And, and if you're not, if your animals are not gaining, or if they're gaining below a half a pound per head per day, typically you're better off taking the price slide and selling early at a lower weight than waiting for a bigger hit on this or make less money, is what it turns out. I, yeah, again, I don't think it's huge, but I, I think it's like in the 10 to 20% range. So it depends on how fast they gain. At the end. Yeah. Do you think that your results might have been different if these were systems that are grazed year round? Because you see that initial spike or that initial difference in the foraging activity between the carb and the yeah, traditional, and that seems to come together. So, in, like mm -hmm. a, in an ecosystem like Oklahoma, do you think maybe we could see more benefits for carb compared to traditional? Or is that, or do you think that maybe not? I just think you're going to see much less difference in anything you do in the dormant season. I mean, you're just eating dead vegetation. I think if, you know how you're supplementing and the quality of your vegetation when it's dormant are going to be huge factors determining that. So um, I do think there's like less, there's much less opportunity for selective foraging in the dormant season. So it probably isn't a big advantage. Yeah. Thank you. Do you think that water placement throughout the pastures had um, an effect on how the cattle were using those pastures? 
So that's one uh, one thing that I, uh, reviewers have pointed out for sure yeah. is that um, Sorry. <laughs> is that these are small pastures. Yeah, yeah. still get the your pastures are so small. They, I can tell you that they're heterogeneous enough that there's spatial variation in foraging. You saw the spatial variation in foraging distribution under TRM in that pasture, um, but it was not related to where the water was. That corner of the pasture is not where the water was. Okay. Um, so these pastures are small enough. There's a problem with the experimental design is that these pastures are small enough that water distribution is not constraining. It's not really a factor. They can walk from one side to the other fairly quickly. Um, you know, it's a mile. Um, I do think that if you redid this at, with much larger pastures, you may see some um, you may see some constraints on how the TRMs perform just because they're not using the whole pasture and you're leaving patches that they just can't access due to water distribution. So if your water distribution is more limited, I think you might get slightly different results from this, but we didn't have that constraint. So. Uh, so kind of two questions. The first one were, or is, uh, were the cattle implanted and did you follow these cattle through the feed yard? They were not, and um, we did not. <laughs> um, in the first five years. Uh, in the most recent years, we have, um, we've been getting animals from three different sources. So first of all, typically we get all our animals from Crow Valley Livestock Cooperative. Most of them are grown locally. Some of them are just purchased from wherever these guys are purchasing them over the winter. So what we did recently, we have a new study, just submitted the paper yesterday. Um, we got steers from the Mark Research Center in Lincoln that were raised, these, these are steers that as calves were raised on um, smooth brome and corn. We got steers from a high elevation population uh, from CSU, and then we got steers from a local ranch that were raised as calves right next to this experimental range. And we ran all of them in both CARM and TRM, so like 10% of CARM and TRM from Lincoln, Nebraska, and looked at the different, we, we're getting some really big, the local steers are gaining much better than the far away steers, but we're following them through feedlot now and all the way to finishing. And Nebraska steers are performing much better in feedlot because much more good at it. So we're seeing these like trade offs, like animals that are really good at grazing and doing well on range do seem to not do as well in the feedlot and vice versa. Uh, and we're starting to try to think about some of those things. I haven't seen any of the results for like the carcass traits, but that is supposed to be coming. Yeah. Is there any plan to maybe incorporate you know, sex ratios or age covariates and variation in grazing or behavior between individuals or among individuals? Uh, well, these were all yearling steers. Right. So um, I did do, uh, I did compare grazing behavior between the three origins and they don't differ that much. So we think the differences are probably genetic and or human based. Um, so they all seem to know what to, how to move and change their grazing in response to bad quality forage. Um, but yeah, I, I'm doing this. I am working with a, a couple cow calf birds on other locations, uh, and I haven't compared how. I, I don't have any results analyzed yet on how their metrics compare to yearlings, but I hope to do that soon. Any yeah. results on carbon sequence weight? I'm going to, uh, no, <laughs> call Justin. No, we, we've, we've measured it and um, we're going to do it again this year for the 10th year. I mean, I, I didn't expect to see anything in the short term. We haven't, but I don't expect to see anything. All right. Well, let's give Dr. Oxy another round of applause, please. Um, so after this, we are going to have a happy hour at Stone Cloud. Y'all are welcome to join us and uh, pick David's brain a little bit more. So see you guys there. Thank you.